Black Slave Owners by Philip Burnham In 1830, Philip Burnham points out in this essay more than 12,000 American slaves were owned by Americans who were themselves black. How this came to be, as Burnham also notes, a fascinating and complex story. It is of course common knowledge that throughout pre-Civil War American history, many persons of color had one way or another obtained their freedom. That a small but important minority of them owned slaves is less well known. Why they invested in slaves and how their ownership affected the slave-master relationship and also the larger question of how free blacks in general related to the mass of those held in bondage is the subject of Burnham's study. Southern whites commonly referred to slavery as their quote-unquote peculiar institution. By peculiar they meant particular or unique, but how the situation worked out when blacks were owned by other blacks was often peculiar also, in the sense of odd. Philip Burnham is a Washington-based journalist who specializes in issues of concern to minorities. In the 1640s, John Cassor was brought from Africa to America, where he toiled as a servant for a Virginia landowner. In 1654, Cassor filed a complaint in Northampton County Court, claiming that his master, Anthony Johnson, had unjustly extended the terms of his indenture with the intention of keeping Cassor his slave for life. Johnson, insisting he knew nothing of any indenture, fought hard to retain what he regarded as his personal property. After much wrangling, on March 8, 1655, the court ruled that, quote, the said Jono Cassor Negro shall forthwith be returned unto the service of his master, Anthony Johnson, consigning him to a lifetime of bondage. Given the vulnerable legal status of servants, black and white, in colonial America, the decision was not surprising, but the documents reveal one additional fact of interest. Anthony Johnson, like his chattel, Cassor, was black. Johnson's life in America has something in it of a rags to riches tale. He appears to have arrived in Virginia in 1621 and is noted in the early records simply as Antonio, a Negro. Though the general muster rolls of 1625 list his occupation as servant, 25 years later he had somehow accumulated a respectable surname and 250 acres of land on Virginia's eastern shore, surviving both a fire that damaged their plantation and the protracted legal tiff with Cassor, Anthony and his wife, Mary moved to the eastern shore of Maryland in the early 1660s, their contentious slave in tow. In 1666, Johnson leased a lot of 300 acres, on which the prosperous landowner remained until his death. As for Cassor, he stayed on as a servant, witnessing Mary Johnson's will of 1672 and registering his own livestock brand in the same year, apparently something of a colonial success story himself. By the early 18th century, the Johnson family had disappeared from the historical record, but in the 150 years that followed, many other black slave owners imitated Johnson's example, and for a variety of reasons. According to 1830 U.S. Census records, 3,775 free blacks living mostly in the South owned a total of 12,760 slaves. Though the vast majority of these owned no more than a few slaves, some in Louisiana and South Carolina held as many as 70 or 80. Nor was the South the only region to know black slave owners. Their presence was recorded in Boston by 1724 and in Connecticut by 1783. As late as 1830, 
some blacks still owned slaves in Rhode Island, Connecticut, Illinois, New Jersey, and New York, as well as in the border states and the District of Columbia. The motives that guided black slave owners were many and complex. Most of them appear to have owned slaves for the benevolent purpose of protecting family members from a society that habitually regarded free black people with deep suspicion. But a significant minority did so for the same reasons that motivated white slave owners, commercial profit and prestige. Slave owning on the part of this latter group was a strategy for assimilation in a mistrustful and potentially explosive social atmosphere. Not only were black slave owners sometimes reviled by other blacks, but they were equally feared by the white middle class as potential usurpers. Whatever our stereotype of the American master in the antebellum era, neither the commercial nor the humanitarian black slave owner easily fits it. A crucial prerequisite for slave owning was, of course, freedom. At the time of the 1830 census, nearly one out of eight blacks in the United States was a, quote, free person of color. Whether by birthright, manumission, or the purchase of his or her freedom, whatever their improved legal status, free people of color still experienced many of the same difficulties that slaves did. The laws differed according to period and region, but free blacks of the antebellum era were generally forbidden the right to vote, to bear arms, and to testify against whites in a court of law. They were often denied credit, consigned to segregated churches, prevented from establishing permanent residences, and even denied licenses to sell liquor. They often lived side by side with slaves on occasion marrying them, and their white neighbors tended to see them as a potentially disruptive force. Most free people of color were poor. They lived, as the historian John Hope Franklin has put it, in a state of quasi-freedom. There was often deep mistrust between free and enslaved black people. Free blacks only rarely expressed open sympathy for slaves. Most tended to guard jealously the few privileges they had secured. Generally, the higher they rose, the more advantages they hoped to protect. And though free people of color might embrace racial equality as a worthy ideal, many used their intermediate status to exploit those at the bottom. What's more, such tensions, as the historian Ira Berlin has noted in Slaves Without Masters, often divided free Negroes from one another as much as it divided them from whites. In absolute terms, the number of slave-owning blacks was always small. In antebellum North Carolina, for example, only about 10% of free blacks owned any kind of property at all, let alone slaves. In the America of 1830, more than 300,000 people of color were free. Of these, about 2% were slaveholders. One scholar has estimated that from 1790 to 1860, just one in 80 free blacks was a slave owner. Blacks who owned slaves were thus a tiny minority within a minority. Of course, white slave owners were a minority too, though a much larger one composing about a third of white families in the first half of the 19th century. Booker T. Washington, born to slavery in Virginia, revealed in 1905 that he did not even know black slave owners had existed. Perhaps he did not want to, for black masters, though few, were widespread. Their presence, as John Russell wrote in his 1916 history of early Virginia, quote, so common in the period of the commonwealth as to pass unnoticed and without criticism by those who consciously recorded events of the times. It is not unusual to find that people of color who owned slaves did so for humanitarian motives. In the 1830s, John Barry Meacham, 
a St. Louis minister bought bondsmen and then invited them to purchase their freedom on easy terms. A woman from Charleston, South Carolina, sold a slave in 1828 on the condition that, quote, he is kindly treated and is never sold, he being an unfortunate individual and requiring much attention. In one extraordinary case, a Baptist Negro church in Lexington, Kentucky, is said to have gained a slave preacher by paying for him on the installment plan, passing the Sunday collection plate to pay the deacons of a local white congregation who had purchased him. Most often, black slave owners were men who had bought their own family members. For instance, Mosby Shepherd, manumitted by the Virginia legislature for giving information concerning the Gabriel insurrection of 1800, bought his own son with the express purpose of later freeing him. Owning blood relatives could be a convenient legal fiction to protect them from the hostility that free blacks attracted. Often, it was a way to evade stringent laws requiring newly freed slaves to leave the state within a certain period. Sometimes, free blacks married slaves and raised families. If the slave in such a unison was owned by a third party and, quote, threatened with freedom, the spouse could purchase him or her. Some laws even made it easier for blacks to own family members than to manumit them. Frequently, terrible decisions would have to be made, as when children had to be sold off to purchase a spouse. Rose Peterfer of New Bern, North Carolina, bought her husband, Richard Gaskin, a runaway who had spent several years roaming the woods. They raised several children, later hired out as slaves, presumably to keep family finances afloat. Daniel Brown of Norfolk, Virginia, purchased his freedom through hard work and was sold to his wife and to avoid the law requiring newly manumitted slaves to leave Virginia. When Brown decided he wanted to emigrate to Liberia, his wife balked, not only refusing him permission to go, but threatening to sell him. After great effort, he persuaded her to manumit him, and he shipped out for Liberia. In 1854, Brown wrote from Monrovia, pleading that, quote, Liberia is the place for us and our children, and nowhere else but here. Later that year, Anne finally decided to join him. Ownership could, of course, add a strange dimension to ordinary family squabbles. Dilsey Pope of Columbus, Georgia, a free woman of color, owned her husband. After they quarreled, she sold him to a white slave owner. He refused to sell him back once the couple had reconciled. Carter Woodson, the historian who in the 1920s published the research on black slaveholders in the 1830 census, recalled an acquaintance whose mother had been purchased out of slavery by her husband, himself a former slave. When later she grew enamored of another man, a slave, it turned out, and secretly bestowed upon him her husband's manumission papers, the police, thinking the husband had conspired to give up his papers, arrested him and brought him to trial. To cover his legal expenses, the angry husband sold his wife for $500. Black slave owners, like white ones, sometimes bid for their charges on the open market. Many, however, did not actively seek to obtain slaves, but inherited them from family members or white neighbors. In the latter case, the person inherited often appears to have been the product of a secret sexual liaison. Henry Lipscomb, a white slave owner from Cumberland County, Virginia, willed several slaves, probably his own children, to a black family by the same name, headed by Nancy Lipscomb, a, quote, free woman of color. Another black woman, Priscilla Ivey of Mecklenburg County, Virginia, inherited several slaves from a white man in 1821 and held them for 35 years, eventually willing them to her children. 
humanitarian motives didn't always play a part in the black slave owner's trade. Nat Butler of Aberdeen, Maryland, obtained slaves by a gambit worthy of Simon Legree. Something of a rarity, Butler specialized in turning high hopes to abject misery. He was known to help runaways, providing them with a hiding place while they waited to escape north. At the same time, posing as a slave catcher, he would offer to resell the runaways to their original owners. If the price offered was too low, Butler would sell the slaves to a third party for a neat profit. Like their white counterparts, black slave owners advertised for runaways. Sarah Johnson, a seamstress from Charleston, South Carolina, placed an ad in a local paper in August 1836 to locate a servant of, quote, small stature, a little pitted with smallpox, her front teeth much decayed, and had on a striped blue frock when she went away. It is suspected that she will try and go into the country. I will pay any reasonable reward, end quote. In 1859, Eliza McNellage offered a reward of $20 in the Charleston Mercury for a 16-year-old named Mary who was well known in the vicinity of Market and Archdale streets. Some owners mingled their more generous instincts with economic self-interest. Samuel Smith of Chesterfield, Virginia willed his slave family to his daughter-in-law to hold the above-mentioned slaves during her natural life and at the death of the above-named Betsy Smith, I desire that they shall be free. Smith had earlier used a child as collateral for a loan, stipulating that should he not repay the outstanding debt, his creditor should, quote, expose the said Negro boy for sale. The evidence suggests that the child was Smith's own son. In 1845, Rixum Webb of Caroline County, Maryland, willed to his son a slave named Jerry to be kept for ten years and then freed. The will provided good incentive for the bondsman to accept his lot. Quote, Should Jerry abscond from service and be taken, the document read, he was to be sold for life to the highest bidder. Richard Parsons, a farmer and boatman, of Campbell County, Virginia, set free his slave children in a will of 1842, but made no such provisions for nine other slaves he considered simply to be property. In a particularly complex case, Judith Angus of Petersburg, Virginia, willed her estate to her sons, George, Moses, and Frank. Moses was free at the time. The other two were slaves. The 1832 will stipulated that George was to be freed unless Moses returned to Petersburg, in which case the former was to be, quote, at his disposal. If George did remain a slave, he was to be hired out, the funds from his labor to be used to buy free the third son, Frank, owned by another party. Among black slave owners, family hierarchy could have its harsh prerogatives. The legal complications encountered by families part slave and part free were nothing short of Byzantine, and in many cases Solomon himself would have been hard-pressed to mete out justice. A slave named Miles took a slave wife in North Carolina. He was freed by his master and then purchased his wife, whom he in turn freed. One of their children was born when the mother was a slave, the others when she was free. When the mother died, Miles remarried a free woman of color by whom he had several more children. In 1857, Miles died intestate. The children of both mothers disputed the division of property. The North Carolina Supreme Court reasoned that the children of the first marriage had no claim to the estate since slaves could not make contracts that were legally binding. Thus, Miles' original marriage was a quote-unquote fiction, the children not recognized as legal heirs. He had, in short, 
failed to legitimize the marriage once he and his wife had become free. Many black slave owners lived in cities where they freely mixed with local slaves and occasionally bought and sold them. Urban slave owners engaged in a variety of occupations. They were barbers, livery stablemen, blacksmiths, mechanics, grocers, and even prostitutes. In South Carolina and Louisiana, a powerful mulatto caste developed in the large cities, compromising lighter-skinned people of color who separated themselves at all cost from the lowly slaves who worked the plantations. The slave owners among them amassed considerable commercial power, often parlaying it into greater social acceptance and educational advancement. Like slaves, most free blacks were illiterate, but along the lower Mississippi some obtained more than a rudimentary education and left letters and diaries that offer fascinating glimpses into the lives of antebellum black slave owners. Among these was William Johnson, a slave turned free man of color in Natchez, Mississippi. Granted his freedom in 1830, Johnson set up business in Natchez as a barber and money lender until he purchased a nearby farm. At the time of his death in 1851, he owned 15 slaves with an eye to turning a profit. And yet, his diary indicates some of them evoked in him a turbulent mixture of emotions. Quote, Today has been to me a very sad day. He wrote on December 31, 1843, Many tears were in my eye today on account of my selling poor Stephen. I went under the hill this evening to see him, but the boat did not cross over again, and Stephen got drunk in a few minutes, and I took him home and made him sleep in the garret and kept him safe. Johnson, who had bought Stephen in 1832 for $455, had just sold him for $600. The next day, the former slave still grappled with his conscience. Quote, I felt hurt, but liquor is the cause of his troubles. I would not have parted with him if he had only have let liquor alone. But he cannot do it, I believe. As a black slave older, Johnson was caught in a tangle of ironies. His diaries reveal the rancor he felt toward the arrogant white slave owners of his area though he was cautious to keep his resentment under wraps. While he expressed considerable compassion for his slaves, the only one who ever escaped from him was helped to freedom by a man he called a white scoundrel. Johnson was murdered in 1851, apparently by a mulatto whose race the courts had difficulty ascertaining. Baylor Wynn, who claimed Indian and white ancestry, was never found guilty of murdering Johnson because it could not be proved that Wynn was a Negro. Mississippi law forbade the testimony of black witnesses against white people, and as the only witness for the prosecution were people of color, Wynn was never convicted. Andrew Durnford, a free man of color in nearby Louisiana, was a sugar planter who owned 77 slaves at his death in 1859. In his correspondence, Durnford described his 1835 visit to a slave auction in Richmond, Virginia. Quote, I went to see a family of four children, father and mother, for $1,800 of yellow complexion. He wrote to a Louisiana friend, I acted and played the indifferent, saying they were too high an offer family of a father and mother with two children for 1200 I was requested to make an offer, but would not do it, as I find that some of the farmers don't like to sell to Negro traders, but will to anybody that buys for their own use. In fact, Durnford was buying for his own use on the sugar plantation he called St. Rosalie, 30 miles south of New Orleans, a man of business, he lamented the high cost of slaves, complaining that 
Alabamians had bid too high and driven up the market price. I could have bought some cheaper, but they are what I call rotten people. After buying 25 slaves, he encountered some difficulty getting them home. Quote, I wrote in Baltimore to get a passage on board of the brig Harriet cleared for New Orleans, but the captain would not agree to take blacks. Dumford's correspondence is richly revealing of the complicated lives led by antebellum mulatto planters. His letters from Richmond are addressed to John McDonough of New Orleans, a white friend and creditor who later served as vice president to the American Colonization Society, which resettled free slaves in Liberia. McDonough, an unusual master by any standards, sent 85 of his slaves to this African republic and later provided in his will for the manumission of many others. Dunford was not so sanguine about the prospects of manumission, though he did free four slaves during his life. Quote, Self-interest is too strongly rooted in the bosom of all that breathes the American atmosphere, he wrote in 1843. Self-interest is a la mode. Paternalism and cruelty went hand in hand at Dunford's plantation. Jackson has just left here. He wrote of a runaway in 1836. I ordered five rounds to be given him yesterday for cutting my cane and corn. He is a wicked fellow. Was he not a relic? I would get clear of him. As the Civil War approached, more restrictions were imposed on black slave owners, and the abolitionist press made white southerners warier still of this unusual group in their midst. As northern cries for manumission grew stronger, certain states denied free blacks property rights. In 1860, the North Carolina legislature formally forbade blacks to, quote, buy, purchase, or hire for any length of time any slave or slaves, or to have any slave or slaves bound as apprentice or apprentices. As public opinion turned against free blacks, William Ellison, Jr., a free mulatto whose father owned dozens of slaves, attempted to leave South Carolina in 1860. The agents for a Philadelphia steamer refused Ellison and his children passage, claiming that if they turned out to be escaped slaves, anyone found guilty of helping them leave the South could be executed. They suggested instead that Ellison declare his children slaves, though they would not, and put them in the charge of a white passenger. Sensing danger, he obtained passage for them on another ship by using his influence and financial resources. Clearly, even the wealthy mulatto had come to feel threatened by the eve of the Civil War. Elsewhere in the Deep South, the landowning mulatto caste was anxious to prove its loyalty to the cause. Several black slave owners in the Delta region wrote jointly to the New Orleans Daily Delta in December 1860 that, quote, the free colored population of Louisiana own slaves, and they are dearly attached to their native land, and they are ready to shed their blood for her defense. They have no sympathy for abolitionism, no love for the North, but they have plenty for Louisiana. Thus, the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 struck as much of a blow to commercial black slave owners, like the descendants of William Johnson and Andrew Dumford, as it did to their white counterparts. And where owners were compensated for their losses, even those with benevolent motives profited, providing a windfall for people who had been protecting family members. In the District of Columbia, for example, where slavery was abolished in 1862 in advance of the proclamation, Robert Gunnell received $300 each for his wife, children, and grandchildren, 18 people in all. That black people could have owned slaves at all is a strange irony of American history, one that has led to all manner of theorizing, much of it untenable. It would be a mistake, for example, to think that black slaveholders turned the entire institution of slavery on its head. 
for even the most powerful black planters could own only people of color, not whites. Though whites were commonly employed as indentured servants in the colonial era, they were never held as slaves as the term is normally used. It is true that free people of color sometimes hired white laborers for temporary work. Quote, I send Noel up to let you know that I will do without Dutch people this year, end quote wrote Andrew Dunford to John McDonough. But as a Virginia statute from 1670 proclaims, quote, No Negro or Indian, though baptized and enjoined their own freedom, shall be capable of any purchase of Christians, but yet not debarred from buying any of their own nation, end quote. The existence of the statute seems to suggest that the holding white slaves or servants was conceivable for a black only in the early years of colonial Virginia. Such a practice, had it endured, would have undermined the entire social foundation of slavery, resting as it did on the oppression of people of color. Over the years, a number of unconvincing apologies have been offered on behalf of the black slaveholder. The historian Luther Porter Jackson has argued that the 1830 census figures for black slave owners were inflated, since some of those who appear on the rolls were people of color who had hired slaves, not purchased them. Even so, it's difficult to claim that people who hired others from their owners were not profiting participants in the peculiar institution. It has been noted that many black slaveholders were at least in their intentions, benevolent. But it's also clear that not all slaves owned by family members, ostensibly sympathetic masters, were treated with much compassion. Benevolent slave owning in the northern states is even more difficult to rationalize since the act of manumission there was less fraught with legal difficulties. Examined in all its variety, the story of black slave owners gives powerful evidence that slavery was just as complex an institution for them as they grappled with economic forces and social realities, as it was for whites. Anthony Johnson and his spiritual descendants remind us that however much we may generalize, the experience of individuals ranges from the heights of human compassion to the depths of profound greed and all variations therein. As Andrew Durnford wrote in his will, quote, I also hereby emancipate in order to be emancipated the boy of my servant, Waney, born the 2nd of January, 1857. And when the said boy shall be 10 years old, I hereby give him $2,000 to contribute to give said boy a good education. The boy, it turns out, wasn't just anyone. He was Dumford's son by a slave mistress. Even after death, Dumford was looking out for his own. As the planter himself had once put it in a letter to McDonough, self-interest is a la mode. End of Black Slave Owners by Philip Burnham